Hello and welcome to Forgotten Friends. I am Jeremy, and today we're going to be playing Count Jalon's Attack. But first, the history. If you don't want to hear the history, a time will come up on your screen. Wait for it. Now! As the attack on Hugamon resumes, something else draws the eyes of the Duke of Wellington, massing French infantry columns on his left and center, and so he moves the artillery in response. Count Drouet d'Erlon was eager to make up for his performance at Quatrebras two days before, and Napoleon was anxious after the reports of the 7th Hussars confirming the advance of the Prussians. Around the same time, the artillery also massed, with 24 12-pounders of the guard, 12 12-pounders, and 48-pounders of Delon's divisional artillery. At 1 p.m., Napoleon's beautiful daughters began their bombardment, savaging the troops of Bylan's brigade, while most of the local forces were safely behind the ridge. Luckily for Bylan's brigade, the majority of the cannonballs landing around them were absorbed by the muddy ground. However, the bombardment continued for a quarter of an hour, cutting bloody channels through the Allied brigades and blowing off limbs as the cannonballs flew by. The Duke of Wellington told his cannons to hold fire until the infantry advanced, not wanting his cannons to reveal their positions to the Grand Battery to be blown apart. As the Allied army could not afford the losses as they only had 36 guns, in the region and cannot waste the powder and shot. Even the brave veterans have not experienced a bombardment like this before and tempered their bravado. Meanwhile, in Delon's Corps, 130 skirmishers advanced, harassing the Allied troops while the columns advanced. They clashed with the enemy skirmishers, eventually driving them back as the infantry prepared to move. Unfortunately, through a garbled order, the infantry formed into an out of date style of column which was less tactically flexible. This slowed down their progress, only made worse by the muddy ground and the obsession to keep formation through the smoke, to keep discipline and morale high. All the while, the troops in column would hope that the artillery and skirmishers broke up the infantry lines of the Allied forces, as they could not see them on the reverse side of the ridge. As the ground battery stopped firing and the columns began to advance over the open ground, the massed infantry made easy targets for the artillery. In the 20 minutes the columns advanced over open ground, the artillery fired 600 shots at them. Most of the columns moved to attack Wellington's line directly, while others diverted to attack Papala and La Haye Sainte. As the columns advanced, they were shot at by troops firing from loopholes from the farmhouses and the remaining skirmishers and riflemen nearby. Approaching closer, the British artillery loaded canister shot and the troops deployed in the sunken lane formed into lines. As we begin the second great act of this battle, by attacking with Delon's corps into Wellington Center, I count the great columns and formulate a plan of attack. I will send the leftmost column to attack La Haye Saint, then sending the next four columns to attack and wrap around Bala's brigade, while holding some in reserve to prevent any counterattacks. Then the next two great columns will attack Killerman's Hanoverian brigade, and upon taking the objective, holding position. The ideal outcome of this plan will be splitting Wellington's army in half in between the Hanoverians and the Dutch-Belgian forces, then allowing me to pour reserves in to move in to attack Wellington's rear. But just like in the real attack, I will proceed the attack with a huge artillery bombardment focusing on the Allied infantry, and then sending forth a wave of skirmishers from two of our columns to attack the troops on the forward side of the ridge. And so I return to the Grand Battery to tell them to prioritize infantry opposed to firing at will as our key objective before the attack is to disrupt the enemy as much as we possibly can. But in the process of going over every single battery of cannon, our courier rides up with orders from the Emperor himself to move our corps into attack. You may begin your attack on the English left flank. Attack him aggressively, and discover the strength of his defenses. Emperor Napoleon. The courier writing back to the Emperor, saying that Delon has received his orders and will proceed with his attack, I carry on down the line of the Grand Battery, ordering them to prioritize attacking the infantry. And the Grand Battery begins to unlimber, about to unleash the greatest artillery bombardment in Belgium until the First World War. Couriers rush the various battery commanders stretching from the main road to Brussels all the way to near Papelot, with these new orders in hand. Upon receiving these orders, the Grand Battery becomes a flurry of activity as gunners load their pieces and set their sights on the various infantry along the ridge. The Allied infantry, upon seeing this, prepare for the worst, some of which are able to return to the reverse side of the ridge, while others are stranded in front, some of which lie down in the sunken lane on the top of the crest. All the batteries except for the one on the end, which supports the attack on Papelot, which will bombard the nearby Nassauers. But then the Grand Battery opens up with a roar, the likes of which unheard in Belgium. Opened up with a thunder, shaking the clouds, great clouds of powder on the horizon, blackened our faces and uniforms. The explosion, shaking the ground and deafening us. With some of it in maniacal laughter, I watched as the cannons reached their position and opened fire upon the ridge. 
watching the volley of cannonballs strike the ridge and the Allied infantry in preparation for our assault, moving to an overhead to position to truly admire the first volley of cannon fire as the huge clouds of powder cover the gunners and cannons alike. Then zooming in closer, going down the ranks of the Grand Battery, watching the gunners load and prepare for the second volley of cannon fire on the ridge, until we reach the end of the battery where a few cannons are unable to fire due to their position, which I'll move up to aid the assault on La Haye and the ridge. But I cannot sit and admire the artillery's work forever, as it will be the infantry who will carry the day. And so I begin to move the columns into position, the first of which moving to attack La Haye while I mass the other columns to attack Wellington Center, all the while moving them into much more flexible columns. Moving them in the center, behind the Grand Battery, aligning them with a gap between Kelmonton's Hanoverians and Violin's Dutch Belgian Brigade, as the cannons fire more and more shot into the ridge. The plan is to send in the attack in two waves in very quick succession in order to get the maximum shock. To do this, I'll move the two columns forward and keeping the reserves really close to add for the maximum shock. But in order to do this, I'll have to change up the formation of the line, forming two titanic columns of the Corps infantry. All the while, the Grand Battery pours devastating fire upon the Allied skirmishers on the forward side of the ridge. While forming up these titanic columns, I notice that I have more infantry to spare, so I add a third rank into the attack, forming them behind the other two brigade columns of the massive columns. Then I go along the road, selecting the various division commanders to make sure that their brigades are in a relatively straight line, as a key part of this plan will be order, discipline, and timing, and the plan will be likely to fail if all our units are tracing over top of each other, blocking each other's line of fire, and thus taking away some of the shock from the allied line, which will prove crucial to this plan. As I finish up this almost unnecessary level of organization, the first four columns are nearly in position, and I follow them as I do so, briefly going back to the fifth column, which is still on its way. While doing this, I check again upon the division commanders to make sure that the formation is perfectly straight. Satisfied with the first four columns, I check upon the fifth one moving up, and adjust it slightly as it is slightly off, lining up their commander with the first column's commander. After doing this, I go over to oversee the attack on Lahey Song, but then I find another column that's spare. Originally, I was thinking to add it to the main attack in the center, but then I changed my mind, thinking that I could attack the flank of Bailen's brigade as soon as the first two columns have moved in. Or if that brigade is entirely shattered, I could use it as a reserve against counterattacks of, say, English infantry or cavalry. And so I decided to keep it in its original place, moving it up with the reserves when necessary. All the while in the background, the attack on La Haison is happening. I move back to the main line and decide to move up a brigade, quotation marks, to move up and harass the Allied lines, mainly pushing back the skirmishers on the forward side of the ridge, and if possible, moving up to dismantle or destroy the Allied cannons on the ridge. To accomplish this, I split off at least a 100-man company of skirmishers from each unit from the front rank of the massive columns I've made. Thus the attack of Dolan's Corps has begun. I send the first lot of skirmishers to move in to disrupt the Dutch flank, where I'll soon send the columns of infantry to support them, thus pushing back Byron's brigade. The attack will focus on the Jaeger, the yellow flag troops in the center out the front, and the national militia, the orange flag, on the farthest right of the brigade, and our skirmishers eagerly comply as they literally run up the valley after long hours of anticipation of this major assault. I quickly form them into line to attack the flank of Violence Brigade, following up the ridge as they run up, looking at the damage that Violence Brigade has taken out of the heavy cannon fire that we've inflicted upon them. Briefly looking over to their right and seeing Killerman's Hanoverians, so I return to our line to deal with the next lot of skirmishers to send out doing a very similar maneuver by taking a 100-man company from each unit, forming a brigade quotation marks, of skirmishers, this time to attack the flank of Kielman's Hanoverians and to destroy their artillery which is nearby. As I detach this new brigade of skirmishers, I form it up along the roadside near Kielman's Hanoverians and what appears to be more Nassau Jaeger. As I move up the 2nd Brigade of Skirmishers, I decide to detach them so I can move up the brigade without disrupting their orders. As unlike the artillery phase of this attack, the skirmishing phase is only going to be really short, only really meant to cover the first columns as they move into their reserve positions. Skirmishers moves into position. I carefully positioned the first wave of skirmishers to move in to attack Bailen's brigade, and the skirmishers react, getting up from their place of cover 
to exchange fire with the skirmishers, but in doing so, expose themselves to the fire of the Grand Battery. The Grand Battery will unleash horrific casualties upon them for doing this. And around the same time, I decided to move up the first two columns of the attacking force in between the two brigades. All the while, the second brigade of skirmishers moves up to engage Kielman's Hanoverians. I select all the units in and make sure that all of them are detached so I can move forward their apparent division without disrupting their orders. Then I move their apparent battalions to the field just behind the road before going over to check the, on the attack on the left side on Bion's brigade. There is little reaction so far on the road, but their skirmishers have taken heavy damage due to the cannon fire. And so I extend our line, but make sure to go not too far so I don't get in range of the militia battalion in the sunken lane, which will overpower us with their fire, so I only slightly extend our brigade. Then I go back to the other group of skirmishers, going to attack Kilman's Hanoverians, and move them to attack. The skirmishers in front of their line have already reacted and got up, but have only now turned to face us. But in doing so, I've taken extreme casualties from the Grand Battery, only to be made worse as soon as I move forward our skirmishers to the road and getting them in range, but also being careful of making them not too spread out, as to not become in range of the troops in the sunken lane as well. For the 4th company in this brigade, I have a much more dangerous job than I know the AI will object to, so I quickly take command of them. And then I shuffle the rest of the companies forward to begin the firefight between us and Kielman's brigade. But then I suddenly change my mind on which unit I'm going to give this dangerous task to, citing another company, taking command of them, and charging them straight for the cannon, with a suicide mission basically to destroy them, or capture them, thus causing mayhem behind the allied line, moving them up at the double to take the cannon, while moving the one that was previously in reserve to hold our flank against the Belgian infantry with the unit with the white flag in the sunken lane. So I move into the company, moving towards the cannons in a mad dash, hoping to avoid canister fire as they go. One of the cannons fire, but they loaded ball and miss entirely. My regiment stand up in reaction to this, hoping to fire upon these incompetent skirmishers charging beyond their line. The Hanoverians on our flank fire volley fire, but miss entirely. The Nassauers on our right also fire volley fire, but it all goes into the other companies. But as soon as they get extremely close to the cannon and call the charge, they charge directly for the infantry, and so I tell them to withdraw. Bugler! Second charge! Ah! And so my men decide to charge directly into the infantry. Then they take a nearby volley from the Hanoverians, and so I tell them to withdraw. As they withdraw, however, they take canister fire, as well as taking the smatterings of fire from the nearby Nassauers as they withdraw. Learning from my previous mistake, I send in another company to charge the guns. But as they advance, they also have to run the gauntlet, with the Nassauers firing volley fire, but thankfully, the majority of the musket balls land in the other battalion, so they are mostly safe. In order to stop them from charging the infantry once again, I try to get this company a lot closer to the cannons than the previous one, but in doing so, I take a lot more damage from the nearby Hanoverians. But that doesn't stop them from getting really close, but by the time I hit the charge button, they charge directly into the infantry once again. In my panic to try to withdraw the skirmishers, they enter melee with the nearby Nassauers and take heavy casualties. However, the sacrifice of these two battalions was not in vain as, despite me not being able to capture them, I was able to put the cannons into disorder. Despite this, I really wanted the cannons gone though, so I sent in the 3rd and final battalion to at least attempt to capture the final gun standing. In the meantime, their apparent battalions advance up the valley toward their objective of being in the advanced reserve. Just after this, I briefly decide to look over the attack on Bylan's brigade, and the skirmishing is going relatively well, with the skirmishers distracting the allied skirmishers, allowing our grand battery to cause mass casualties to them. The while the two columns advance up the valley, and both of them are nearly in their position to attack. I am so eager to attack the Hanoverians now that their artillery has been disturbed, and I move up the second column from its original advanced reserve position to its actual attacking position by the road. Now back to the third and final company who are going to charge the cannon, who have a much harsher gauntlet to run through, as they have flanking fire on both sides, all the way there and back. But I wanted to at least make one cannon surrender for all the casualties I've taken so far, so I stubbornly send the next lot in. But they take heavy casualties all the way there from the nearby Hanoverians and Nassauers. I zoom in nice and close so I can make sure I get them as close as I possibly can to the nearby cannon and to target them so they don't charge into the infantry once again. As soon as they get to the gun itself, I immediately hit the charge button, but then they charge immediately for the Hanoverians, the farthest unit away, and seeing that this would only lead to more casualties, I tell them to withdraw, 
but on the retreat they take huge amounts of casualties on both their flanks. Frustrated with the entire affair, I decided to focus in on the attack on the Hay Song, hoping that it would be a lot more successful. On of our men! To the farmhouse! The English may be content to hide behind innocent farmers, so we must save them! The column moves in to attack La Haison, breaching the high hedgerows, led by Colonel Charlotte. I move the column to outflank and overwhelm the farmhouse's defenses. Bodies still remain from the brief skirmishing before the King's German Legion fled into the farmhouse. I slightly change the column's order by moving them back slightly, making sure that we stay in maximum range do not take unnecessary casualties attempt to close the gap. All the while, the garrison of King's German Legion in the farmhouse shoot away from loopholes within the farmhouse. In the meantime, the first columns advance up the ridge, ready to breach Wellington's line. One can only imagine what the Allied soldiers are thinking as they cannot see the advancing French columns. They can only hear the thudding of the drums and the marching of feet, paired with the chanting French infantry, saying Vive l'Empereur! Sunny lads, pay no attention to them! His Majesty the King has brought you your gin ration! The rest of the battalion is less jovial and remains silent in anticipation of the French attack. Some prayed while others slept with the gym. All the while we heard the beatings of the drums from the French columns, like the arms of a great clock taking down. Our first two columns have begun their assault, engaging the Belgian infantry and the Nassau skirmishers in front of the ridge. The second column aligns itself in the road where the skirmish line used to be, threatening the flank of the Nassauers. But curiously enough, the Hanoverians of Kilman's Brigade are appearing to fall back away from their defensive position, leaving the victory point to be easily captured by us once we crest the ridge. Meanwhile, the Belgian infantry pours heavy fire from the sunken lane, leveling nearly an entire company of the regiment facing them. But that matters little, as two more battalions threaten to flank around the Belgian infantry's defensive position, leaving them caught in the sunken lane with a thorn hedge to their back. All the while, more elements from both the columns threaten to split Wellington's line in half. Seeing that the situation is going so well, I decide to look at the holding force of the 1st Brigade of Skirmishers, which is still in a heavy firefight with the Dutch Jaeger, producing many casualties. But in this heavy firefight, the Dutch Jaegers have exposed themselves to the full weight of the Grand Battery, putting solid shot all the way down their files, causing extreme casualties to them. Seeing the success of the attack on the ridge so far, I look back to the assault on the Hay Song, where it appears that two of the battalions have faltered, and so I order them to attack once again, moving them to sweep around the right flank of the farmhouse, making sure that they face the farmhouse and so they don't take flanking fire and thus lose morale. They're a bit stubborn at first, but a few choice words from their commander forces them forward to re-engage with the King's German Legion in the farmhouse. After moving forward with two fragging battalions, I look back to the assault on Balan's brigade on the ridge, with a particular focus on the brigade of skirmishers who have taken heavy casualties in the firefight, but not on the same level as the Dutch Jaeger who have taken sustained fire from the Grand Battery ever since before this assault began. With the Belgian infantry distracted, I decide to move more of my skirmishers to attack the Dutch Jaeger, but this in turn activates the Dutch National Militia nearby, who begin to take up defensive positions in the sunken lane nearby. The second column attacking the Hanoverian Brigade appears to have some flagging battalions as well, which I move onto the road to engage the Nassauers nearby. But as they approach the road, they take volley fire from the nearby Nassauers, causing extreme casualties. Such a large unit is dangerous to engage from the front, but with our smaller but more numerous battalions, we're able to outmaneuver it and thus destroy it more easily. To do this, I move the two leftmost battalions into the massive gap in the Allied line. With later ambitions to attack the Allied victory point that the Hanoverians have thus so carelessly unguarded after the mass hours are dispatched. My original plan was to move forward one battalion while the three others absorb all the fire, but the huge amount of casualties produced after the volley fire of the mass hours led me to change these plans shortly after this event. But luckily in the meantime, more units are rushing up to the road. This helps to alleviate the fire of the mass hours, so gives us more forces to move up to attack them later on. All the while, the nearby commander shouts rallying words to the troops on the roadside, looking to smash the mass hours quickly in order to wrap around the Hanoverians. This situation worries some but stable, I move over to the other column. We can begin to see that the Belgian infantry's heavy fire is beginning to take its toll. One of our battalions has lost an entire company dead or wounded. So I begin to send the second rank of their column to flank around the rear of the Belgian infantry, like I stated earlier. 
With the attack of the initial success, I, move, I go to the rear rank to move up our reserves to a closer reserve position. The way I notice a company of skirmishers that never was attached to the 2nd Brigade of Skirmishers, and so I move it up to attach to the 1st Brigade of Skirmishers since the 2nd one has been all but eliminated by now. Then I proceed to move up the second two columns, the second behind the field by the road, and the first by the flank of the 1st Skirmishing Brigade. After the courier has been dispatched with these orders, I briefly check upon the attack on the Hayson once again. Seeing that all the battalions are firing, I am content, despite the levels of casualties our battalions have taken. Satisfied in knowing that the King's German Legion within have probably taken similar if worse casualties. For once again checking upon the skirmishers attacking Bylan's brigade. Overseeing the grievous casualties to both sides. Funnily enough, one of the companies is refusing to fire once again due to line of sight, presumably, so I move them up to form a new line. In doing so, block the other skirmishers. Zooming in, we can see the grievous casualties caused to both sides. Also, the other battalions are facing similar issues. When I move them up into this new line, the Dutch National Militia open up upon them from on top of the ridge. To support this attack, I move up with two nearby French battalions to attack the Belgian infantry. Holding the two other French battalions that are already flanking the unit. Going over to the second column, I'm going to begin flanking the Nassauers, who will surely shatter under the extreme casualties that we put on them. So I rush the two battalions around the flank of the Nassauers at the double. You already see the massive casualties we put upon the Nassauers with the massive gaps in their lines. The opening up of the gap in the Allied line. Turn to our line to see the progress that they've made to get to their position, in a close reserve. It appears that neither of them have passed the Grand Battery yet. Moving to the left of our line to serve at the attack on the Hayson, the cannons have not unlimbered and began to fire upon the ridge. They decide to move them up to closer support the infantry, in a Gustavian style tactic, with much heavier cannon in this case. After moving the battery forward, I go back to the brigade attacking La Hayson and notice that they're taking grievous casualties in doing so. Zooming in really close to see the damage that has been done, before leaving and surveying the ridge once again. By the time I reach my center, I see something really wonderful is happening. The Belgian infantry is beginning to break. They're breaking, men! The English should have known not to rely on the Dutch traders. We will make him pay for this mistake. Advance for the Emperor! And with that, I send the other battalions forward on the charge to break the, the Belgian army from true and push them for the sunken lane. The charge is broken up slightly by the hedges that fight the sunken lane. Nevertheless, the men keep moving forward, braving the foes to push back their budget foe with their bayonet. To their color, the Belgian infantry is able to stand, despite their disturbed formation, until the bayonet charge arrives. When the bayonet charge arrives, upon first contact, our men push them back with relatively few casualties. The battalion follows the routing Belgians for a while, until the officer manages to regroup them, and we can see why later on, looking down the ridge, we can see the mass casualties they've caused, to the troops below the ridge from the strong defensive position of the sunken lane. And despite being told to halt and not follow the Belgian infantry, our men begin to take shots at the routing Belgians, until the officer tells them to start wasting ammunition on the routing Belgians. I move the rest of the column to flank around the remaining elements of Bylan's brigade, will quickly fall now that both their regular units are in danger or routed. Beginning by moving around the front of the National Militia, moving back to the second column, I notice that our battalions have pushed back the Nassau skirmishers, so I order the entire brigade to move closer to the victory point, and in doing so, I'll move them to attack the Hanoverian Brigade proper. Taking advantage of their intermingled formation, there's a problem. In this intertangled formation is a cannon, and while the brigade moves into position, I check on the progress of our reserves, who have been moving up steadily ever since but now I want to move them up a lot closer. And so I move the fourth column up in double line to the road, in order to quickly reinforce the second column when needed. I likewise move to do this with the third column, but there is no obvious place to put them with the skirmishing still going on halfway down the valley. And so I allow for more time for the first column and the first brigade of skirmishers to push back on the brigade before I deploy the third column. All the while the first column pushes back the elements of violence brigade and concern with the nearby English troops, who now stand up, ready to counterattack when needed. So my plan is to keep my distance for the first column, and when the first brigade pushes back, Barlin's brigade, I'll attack them with their fresh troops in the third column. In the meantime, I begin to move units to surround the National Militia, and I check up on the reinforcement of the skirmishing brigade, as well as the effect of the skirmishing of which. 
Get rid of the second column. I noticed the fire fight room was not favorable, as our troops are being raked by canister fire from the nearby cannon in the intermingled formation of the Hanoverians. How do I respond to this? The same way that I've done the prior time, but now with even more troops. So the risks are even higher. I'm charged by men directly into the cannon and push them back, hoping that the low morale of the sellers will also cause them to fall back likewise. Forward, men! To the cannon! We must make them pay for what they did for our skirmishers! Forward! For the skirmishers! Charge! And my men go charging forward towards the nearby cannon, forming into a column as the gunners attempt to limit their cannon. As they rush forward, they form into a column. Once they're about halfway there, I finally give them their charge orders, and they rush forward. Battery commander rushes forward, trying to urge his men to work faster. And just before contact, the first gun manages to limit. As the vast hour is withdrawn, they're in the full strength of the French infantry. Knowing that the first gun is lost, the commander rushes to the second gun to attempt to persuade them to move quicker, and he stays with them, managing to get the gun to limber, then rushes away as the French infantry approaches, charging forth and capturing his second gun. For this most glorious charge, our battalion is in the perfect spot to provide flanking fire into the nearby Hanoverian line and so I form up the rest of the men of the column on the road on top of the ridge, making ready to continue the fight in the nearby sunken lane, only stopping because of the nearby English infantry. In the meantime, the nearby victory point goes from alley control to contested. The column forms up along the road, I wheel around the one battalion with great difficulty, before reverting to the drug toolbar to actually move around the battalion, to put more musket fire into the flank of the nearby Hanoverians. And then our entire column begins to pour fire into the flank of the Hanoverian brigade. It appears our bayonets were too much for the Nassars, who appear to be retreating off the field entirely. As the column begins to open up fire upon the Hanoverian Brigade, I move the last battalion into place, guarding our flank against a nearby Scottish infantry, moving them into the sunken lane that's been captured off Byron's Brigade. Speaking of Byron's Brigade, we go back to our first column, which is pushed back the Dutch National Militia with ease, and so going back to their commander, I tell the entire column to move up, only being halted are the nearby Scottish infantry of Pack's Brigade, which only persuades me to move the column closer to the ridge line itself. Meantime, another unit of Dutch National Militia are moving up to counterattack, pushing down the sunken lane in the column formation. After surveying this part of the battlefield, I conclude that sending the fresh column into attack near the crossroads where the Duke of Wellington himself is commanding the field would be the best course of action as it would cause major chaos up and down the Allied line. This would open them up to three major attacks, hitting the mass cannon in the Allied center, putting more pressure on, on the Haysan, as well as, as well as hitting Bond's brigade in the back. Seeing the major successes of the first column, I move over to the second column to check on the attack on the Hanoverian Brigade again, seeing if or where I should deploy my reserves. Then I open up our map to see the massive gap forming in the Allied line, trying to check to make sure there's no Allied counterattack. Before I go to our reserve to move them into place in the center of our line to reinforce where necessary. Then I return to the bloodbath, which is the attack on La Haison, moving a nearby battery of cannon to protect the flank of the farmhouse, to make sure no allied counterattack sneaks around its flank, before returning to the ridge to oversee the attack happening there. Returning to the first column, I notice that the Belgian infantry has reformed and have moved into counterattack, and so I move our infantry to take up positions in the sunken lane behind the thorn hedges, to give them a taste of their own medicine, as the rest of the column attacks the Dutch militia. All the while, I move our third column into position, but in doing so, I activate the 95th rifles and they begin to open fire. And now I move forward our reserves into the front line, moving in the third column to attack Balan's brigade's rear as well as a crossroads, and moving in the fourth column to attack the Scottish infantry supporting the Hanoverians nearby. Bring the fourth column up in double line formation so I can quickly swap out units or move in reserves to flank, before quickly returning to our line to see the fifth column move up into the advanced reserve position. However, by now they haven't made it past the Grand Battery yet, so it will take some time for them to reach their position. I'm checking the map once again, just in case any counterattacks have happened, of say, English cavalry. Also, making sure that all our reserves are up, 
Except for the keen-eyed among you may have noticed I've missed one. They'll play a key role in the next video that's coming. Soon. Moving back to the attack on the ridge, I noticed that there's a gap in our line, and noticed some of our infantry is withdrawing. Probably the unit that lost about half its men in the initial assault against the Belgian infantry. However, as I shout, scornful words to the retreating units, the 4th column advances to take their place, to push back the Belgian infantry and English infantry nearby. Around the same time, the 3rd Brigade comes in to attack Balin's brigade in the rear. The already outmatched brigade will be quickly overrun with these new reinforcements coming in, allowing us to quickly pass them at and attack Wellington at the crossroads directly. But as we approach, taking flanking fire from the 95th Rifles and cannon fire from the nearby artillery, we spot a mass of English infantry, about a brigade, which quickly stops us in our path, as we don't want to face them as well as two batteries of artillery from the front. And so I quickly return to the bloodbath, which is the assault on La Haison. The same two battalions pulling their same shenanigans, now firing upon the garrison of the King's German Legion in the farmhouse. I'm unsure if this is like a line of sight, or if they're withdrawing, which would make sense since they're in the same line as they were before. This would also be explained by the heavy amount of casualties they've received. But unfortunately, this is war, and they will have to carry on the assault if we're to win this day. However, it appears that the garrison of La Haison has been taking some heavy casualties as well, and some of the units have broken, as there's only three flags left in the center of the building. As the firefight at La Haison continues, and our assault on the ridge is gaining success, the video is drawing to a close. Keep this video an imaginable length of time for, for everybody to watch, as well as to keep my voice relatively intact for this next part. Adventures in Time! Plague Edition! My yard is nearly 1.30. The ground attack would have begun. I need to move. I hope this disguise will work. Some time later. Bonjour, mon ami. I would like to buy some bread. Certainly, sir. I will have to go and put it in the oven in the back. Thinking. Well, I better pay an extra for what I'm about to do. <laughs> now to come to safety before the Prussians arrive. Clothes are a bit baggy, but they'll have to do. My bakery is on fire! You incompetent slime! You have blocked the entire army for miles thanks to your incompetence! Quickly, get buckets! Put out the fire! We cannot risk the ammunition! I hope this gives Napoleon enough time. 